Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, session on the technology, a deep dive into connected technology and platforms. My name is Derek Wallace, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for the Lower Alliance, and it is my pleasure to be with you here today. I've been with the Lower Alliance uh, for almost a year now. Uh, previously to that, I've been involved in uh, M2M and IoT for a good number of years now and have worked in technology in the United States, Europe, and Australia. And I am truly, I'm really happy to be here to uh, moderate today's panel. Again, it's the technology, a deep dive into connected technology and platforms. First, let me thank you all for joining the webinar today. This webinar will be recorded. So it's going to allow everyone who can't join at this time to view it at their leisure later on. But for all of you who are with us and live today, we will be having a Q&A section at the end of our discussion, about 30, 40 minutes from now. So as many of you are probably aware with Zoom, there's a nice Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. So for the questions that you have, go ahead and, and put your questions in there, and I'll be moderating that. And, and taking those questions and dishing them out to our panelists later on today. All right, so now let's get to the exciting part in meeting today's panelists who are gonna briefly introduce themselves. Byron, will you go ahead and start, please? Sure, uh, so my name is Byron B. Miller and I'm with Semtech. Uh, in case you don't know, Semtech's about a 60-year-old semiconductor company, which is a provider of the low-power wireless technology called LoRa. Uh, I'm director of business development there for that product line and last couple of years I've been focused on promoting its use within the smart building and smart home sector. Um, I also happen to chair the work group uh, within the LoRa Alliance, uh, which Derek is a part of, um, uh, focused on the same market segment. So thanks for asking me to be a part of this event and specifically this panel. And thanks, uh, Byron, not only for the introduction, for all the work that you do at the Lore Alliance and helping the audience know who I work for, because I think I may have missed saying that. So thanks for that. Okay, Sky, let's go on over to you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Sky Kidder, the Director of Business Development here at Eddy. I have about 14 years of combined experience in technology, construction, and engineering. What really drew me to Eddy was I think more or less bringing innovative tech to all these different spaces and being able to protect really any asset class. Here at Eddie, we're really striving to not just change perceptions, but help our partners and clients change their approach as it pertains to IoT. And in particular for us, IoT water leak mitigation. Thank you, Derek. And thank you, Sky, and good to see your face this week. Awesome. And Barry, let's shoot it on over to you. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Derek. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Barry Poe, uh, President of Connected Solutions and Chief Marketing Officer at a company called mCloud Technologies. Uh, mCloud is one of Canada's fastest growing tech companies. Uh, you know, we, uh, our mission is to unlock the untapped potential of energy intensive assets. So we connect to HVAC units and refrigeration and cold storage in buildings, all through the use of AI, IoT and the cloud. And connected technology is definitely at the heart of our business. So very pleased to be here and I look forward to the panel. Great, thanks very much, Barry. And let's head over to last but certainly not least, Tess. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tess Van Thielen. I'm the Vice President for Advanced Services for Rogers. Um, I work with an extraordinary team to deliver IoT and data center solutions to the Canadian market. We also work on cutting edge technology like 5G, private networks and mobile edge computing. So very excited to be here. Thank you very much, Tess, and thank you to all of our panelists and a big welcome to you. It's great. We've got quite a wide variety of uh, technology solutions represented by our panelists and lots of experience. So audience, get ready. You're going to hear lots of great stuff and a big welcome to all of you as well. So again, I'm just going to remind all of you uh, before we start the questions, we will have a dedicated at least 10 minutes of Q&A at the end of the session. Definitely use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to log your questions and we'll take care of them later on in the show. All right, let's go ahead and start with the first question. And Byron, I'm gonna kick this one over to you. It's been estimated that we'll reach 50 billion connected devices this year, which is truly amazing. 
But what are some considerations from a technical perspective? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so I would say before you do anything, you need to consider the use case. Um, you know, how much data needs to be transmitted and how frequently that needs to be transmitted. And that will dictate whether you can use a device that's battery powered or uh, a device that has to be plugged in. If it has to be plugged in, then you're limited in where you can use those devices. There's obviously not power um, available at every location you might want to monitor something. Um, you have to consider, you know, sort of the RF environment that it's to be working in um, and, and the density of deployment of those devices. Those, those will all um, sort of lead you in different directions. And so at the end of the day, you, you have a lot of technologies to choose from in a smart building environment, uh, especially wirelessly now. Um, and you just need to choose the right tool for the job. Um, so I, I think that's the first consideration you need to take into account. Um, you know, if you're talking about a low data rate battery operated sensor, then, um, you know, LoRaWAN is, is probably about the best option out there. Uh, so that's something to certainly consider. But if you need high data rate connections, uh, you know, video, uh, for example, um, you know, you're going to have to use a different technology like Wi-Fi. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the other suggestions I would give are, you know, you need to get the right people on board within the company. So for example, if you're gonna be uh, monitoring desk usage or something like that, um, you know, do you need to get IT involved? Do you need to get HR involved? Um, you know, you gotta get all the stakeholders um, aligned before you kick off the project. Um, and then the final suggestion is that, you know, really need to clearly define the um, outcomes that you're looking for and you know, sort of the criteria that will cause you to, to move forward to the next step in whatever the project is. Um, a lot of people sort of just you know, have a nebulous idea of what they wanna try, uh, try and collect data on, um, but don't really have a, an end game in mind. So um, you know, you'll be much more efficient and productive in your projects if you, if you know the, the, the finish line you're looking for. Uh, thank you, Byron. You said several things I took notes on um, and that obviously, you know, I very much agree with. I see some smiles from the rest of the panelists. Before I add my comments to that, uh, um, Sky, uh, I saw you nodding. Is there anything that you would like to add? No, for sure. I mean, again, yeah, I think to uh, Byron's point, it's really about use cases. I mean, if we're looking even, I think the earlier we're thinking about this, the better. So when you're at that design stage or pre-construction, construction, construction I guess we're thinking about what risks are we trying to mitigate? And I know for us here at Eddy, obviously water is a huge thing. And then I think ultimately it's, you know, build, building elements. Are we trying to optimize? Are we trying to, you know, hit our schedule or, escal or accelerate our schedule through IoT? And then I think the other pieces to really think about would be, you know, connection, interoperability, power. Uh, do we want devices and systems in play that are going to last a long time? Who's going to manage it, and so forth? Um, and I, I guess again, like, there's so many use cases that can be applied. There's thousands of solutions and devices. I think it really comes down to what are the main critical areas within a building, and then what do what does my partner? What do I need to kind of protect my portfolio? wide and what's scalable, really. Uh, thank you for that, Sky. Um, one thing that I found really interesting and I appreciate is how you talked about part of your answer from your perspective, your own experience as a company, because that takes, you know, this IoT and this connectivity and smart buildings, it takes it from this thing that's kind of out there, depending on where you're at in your journey and really bringing it down and making it real. And I see some more nods from my panelists on that. So Tess, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask if you have anything to uh, add to this this question here. Yeah, I think it was touched upon by both Byron and Sky, but for, from my perspective, the most important part is to have a plan on this at the earliest stages. So, you know, connectivity is an essential service. It's like water, it's like gas. It needs to be part of the, the initial plan. It needs to be part of the design work. And we need to think about the connectivity as, you know, kind of the backbone and infrastructure that can actually help you accelerate you know, it's the sen it can support the sensors, the solutions and the tools to increase the efficiency, to mitigate risk and to lower costs. But it's only if you start planning for it in the beginning, retrofitting later can be very, very expensive and incredibly challenging. 
I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, that, that saying in whatever industry it is, measure twice, do once, you know, preparation at that time is just, it's incredibly key. You don't want to get involved in a project uh, and then a third of the way in it, a halfway in it, whatever stage you realize I, it's useless. All that work and effort and time and money I spent into it, it's, it's useless. Barry, anything else that you would like to uh, contribute to, to this? Yeah, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing from everyone is that good planning is essential, which I would absolutely agree with. Don't uh, don't go into an IoT project head first without having done a little bit of due diligence. I, I think one of the things that's really important, and I, I see this a lot, you know, in our own engagements at mCloud, is when we go into buildings, we have to bear in mind and remind ourselves that we're already going into a pretty complex ecosystem of a lot of existing technology and a lot of existing infrastructure. So that interoperability is key. You know, you're, you're bringing in connected technology that sits on top of a lot of stuff that's already inside a building. So whether you're dealing with IoT protocols as we're talking about here, or even building protocols like Modbus and BACnet, you know, we've got to make sure that when we're engaging in these projects that we're looking at the whole end-to-end -end environment and not just at the stuff around the device because all of this stuff has to work together. Thanks, Barry. I take, I was taking notes on that, and I was actually smiling to myself because interoperability is, is is so key. You can have the best technology in the world, and if you're in that mixed environment, like you said, and your technology doesn't play well with others, you know, it's a pretty good way to get your yourself isolated and and an outdated technology. It actually reminded me way back in the days of ISDN, which actually was a good technology, but all the different islands of ISDN, you know, it, it just faded away because it wasn't fit for purpose to do the job for scale. Um, so really good points. And, and something Byron said as well, that it's so true in my own experience too, and I'm sure this is true with everybody. Not only do you need a plan, like all of you have said, and have a good idea of what you wanna do, you really need to know what success looks like. You need to like have that target goal of, if I spend all this time and energy and effort and money to do this, not only did I achieve, you know, accomplish the goal of whatever that project or use case application is, but then it's, it's that measurement to say, and it was worthwhile doing it because we achieved X, whatever that X is. So um, really just, this is lots of, I'm just thinking about all these memories of previous projects or reports of how the, you know, all the big reasons why IoT projects fail and all of you are hitting on the reasons why they would, but in the positive way, make sure to do these things and your projects won't fail. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move on over to question two, and Barry, I'm going to throw this one to you to start. So it's been said, we're living in the age of technology. In your experience from the cloud computing world, what does this mean in terms of implications for data storage and speeds? That's a really good question. You know, I, what I, one reflection that I'll have here uh, is that our ability to deploy technology that collects data always outpaces our ability to make sense of it. Uh, and that's true in a building landscape, you know, where you're thinking about connecting a building or an environment that might be generating gigabytes of data every day. You know, you're connecting lots of sensors, lots of data points being collected simultaneously uh, in all these different parts of a building. So we always need to be mindful of compute and network bandwidth. You know, how much data needs to go to the edge or goes to the cloud. Uh, and so it's really important that we understand what our network requirements are, you know, how much bandwidth is necessary to make sure that you've got a reliable uh, connection with, uh, with a big enough pipe to push that much data through. Uh, the other part of it is compute. You know, where does that compute happen? Uh, and does it need to happen on at the edge? You know, because response time is important because reliability is important. Does it happen in the cloud because your edge device doesn't have enough compute? Uh, all of those are really important considerations, especially as we think about how to make sense of the data. It, it is definitely one thing to collect the data. It's another thing to put that data to use and turn it into something valuable for the end customer. Absolutely, I mean, data is great, but isolated by itself, what's the point? Um, and the whole question, distributed intelligence or processing in the cloud, again, the use case, which, what do you need to solve uh, the problem that um, you are facing. Uh, anyone else uh, would like to uh, uh, add to that? I see, you know, some nods again, but I'm going to switch it up and uh, test. I'm going to ask if you have anything to add to this. It was really interesting what, what Barry was talking about. I think for me, one of the other elements that I always like to, 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 to think about 
is to add in the data sovereignty question. Where do you need your data housed and stored? Do you need it to stay in Canada for a reason? Are you okay with it, you know, transversing the border and being in a cloud storage facility in the US? So when we think about, you know, all of what Barry talked about in terms of thinking about the technology solutions, and then you add on the data sovereignty, that I think then gets you a really good comprehensive view of what your options are. Um, that is, it's so true and it's a lot of, it's, it does surprise me how often we don't think about data going over borders. And, you know, I lived in Europe for a while and worked there and, you know, they were kind of one of the first that were really at the edge of, you know, there's a lot of countries in a small space of sending uh, data across borders, especially certain industries. Some are more lax than others and you really need to know what the rules are in each industry and then apply the lessons that you talked about there. So really great, I, you know, more insight. I didn't even think about that. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Sky, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think Barry and, and Tess really just kind of hit it on the head. I think it's thinking about your network. What are the requirements? I think industry requirements, I think um, security, I, I think we'll touch on that a bit more a bit later, but definitely we'll have to take into consideration when it comes to where you're storing your data. I think size, and I also think about from the customer's point of view or even the vendor, I think you know it being affordable and affordable solution and being very scalable. Great, thank you for that, Sky. Byron, anything to add for you? Uh, yeah, I'll just add a little bit to what Tess said. So, um, you know, taking it even a step further is, uh, you know, we've seen different situations where not only do, are people not comfortable with the data crossing a border, they're not comfortable with it even leaving the building. Um, and so that can have a, you know, effect on the architecture that you choose and the solution that you choose. Um, and, you know, from my experience, this, uh, I see differences in different geographies. Um, you know, my experience has been that uh, European businesses are a little more comfortable with cloud-based storage and there's more U.S. businesses that are, you know, have firm rules against data leaving the, the building. Um, I don't know why that is, but uh, that, that's just kind of what I've seen. But that, that's another consideration um, when, you're, when you're designing your network. Thanks, Byron. Uh, very interesting as well. You're right. It's not just borders. It's, it's also buildings which always makes me curious because when technology as a security issue is pointed out by a lot of people, it's almost often positioned that it, the technology is the only security issue. Whereas you could have really bad per, in person, bring home something on a, on a um, what are those things called? You don't know what I'm thinking, my, the thumb words drive. are gone. Thumb drive. Thank you, on a thumb drive with no password and leave it somewhere and then someone has access to it or someone just walks out with passwords. Um, so security, it's, it's multifaceted and there's lots of different uh, factors to consider. Um, so thank you very much. And also our fine panelists, if I happen to throw a question to you and you're not really ready to answer, you just don't really feel like you want to contribute anything more, it's okay to say, Derek, I'm good, you can move on. So I just wanted to share that as well. Okay, let's go on to question three. And, and this one's really interesting for, for me um, and you all touched on it in the very first question. It's use cases. It's amazing how much use cases drive so many decisions. So for this uh, third question, and Tess, I'm going to start off with you on this one. In buildings, there are different use cases that need to be solved in terms of connectivity. And it's important to choose the right technology to fit the builder's needs. So Tess, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think use cases is, is really interesting and, you know, with how fast technology is moving and how many different solutions are coming to the market, it's actually really exciting the types of use cases that are available. I mean, you know, monitoring is, is, a, is a really important use case. You know, we can leverage IoT sensors to mon monitor concrete maturity as well as humidity levels when you're doing drywall installation and when you're doing mill work. Um, you can look at occupancy post building construction. There's health and safety monitoring and solutions available. So you can, you know, track your workers, track their safety. You know, as we move farther and farther along into 5G and edge computing, autonomous vehicles become an option for us. And that's a really interesting use case. Um, there's building information, uh, modeling and analysis activity that can be done. And all of these things are, need to be thought of from an interoperability perspective, but also from a connectivity perspective. And so, you know, as we talked about in the first question, 
you know, building a plan from the beginning to support that, you need to be able to support the connectivity needs both into the building as well as to each floor of the building. Because you need to be able to be thinking about all of those high bandwidth applications that are required in each level of the building versus just the building as, a, as, as one entity. Uh, so we're, we're really interested in making sure and helping people think about how they build the buildings and future-proof them and get them 5G ready and how they can think about what they need to be doing at the building stage to make it as flexible as possible in the future to support all of the new technologies that are coming online. Thanks, Steph. That was really interesting. I'm just sitting, I'm doing the nodding now because I, I really like some of the stuff that you said. Uh, Byron, anything to add there? Yeah, actually, I could, I could go on for a long time about this, but um, so, you know, tenants are becoming, are coming to expect more from their buildings as opposed to just a, a place to show up and work and, you know, not, not sweat because <laughs> it's hot outside or not freeze because it's cold outside. Um, you know, they, they want them to be safer, and especially in this COVID era and post-COVID era, um, and greener and, you know, and actually contribute to enhancing productivity. Um, so, you know, uh, building owners and building operators um, need to be mindful of that. And um, I think Tess mentioned earlier, uh, you know, connectivity is, is something like water or electricity that people just come to expect, expect right now. Um, you know, it, it's things like Wi-Fi and 5G are kind of at the tip of everybody's mind and, and everybody will look at those and how they want to make sure those services are adequately provided to the, to the uh, tenants of a building. But those are not going to address all the use cases out there. Um, those are very good for, for certain things, but um, like everything, there's trade-offs. Um, so you trade off bandwidth and availability uh, for power consumption, for example. Um, and so... Uh, you know, there, there's there's going to be different tools for the job, as I as I mentioned before. Um, in fact, the the Lore Alliance, Derek, um, you know, has co-published the white paper with the Wireless Broadband Alliance um, on how Wi-Fi and and Lora are complementary technologies. They 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 work together and not at odds with each other. So, building owners and building managers and, and even the tenants have to decide, you know, how do they want to get these networks put in and and provided. Uh, do they want, is it something that they want their IT department to do themselves? Um, do they want to partner with an outside party to put in a private network for themselves? Do they want to party with an outside partner such as Rogers that you know can provide network services um, you know, on, a, on a wide scale basis and, and outsource that, that function to somebody else? Does the building owner want to put the network in themselves and sort of be a neutral host that everybody in the building can, can jump on that network and use it for whatever purpose they need to? There's a lot of things to be considered um, when you're talking about the network platforms. Uh, and the final point, point I'd make is, um, you know, all these, uh, it, it, putting one of these together into end solution is not, um, you know, there's a lot of decisions that have to made, be made. So, you, you know, do you need to get a systems integrator involved in the project? What platform do you use to access the data and act upon the data? Uh, what cloud, you know, how, how do you, are you storing the data uh, in the cloud? What cloud provider? So, um, you know, these are all considerations on, on uh, platform selection. Thanks, uh, thanks, Byron. And, and Barry, I'm just gonna kick it over to you now. Yeah, thanks. Anything to add? Uh, I definitely, I'd like to build on top of what Tess and Byron have both been saying. I think the one thing better than a, than a use case is a well-defined use case. Uh, and I, I think that that's very true in the building environments, especially when you consider, I think as Byron mentioned, tenants have expectations and they have this expectation that the technology is seamless, it just works. Uh, and so when it doesn't, you know, problems start to creep up that way. So it's really important when we're thinking about how to enter a building, how we're gonna create that seamless experience for the tenants, the operators. Uh, so that way we know what happens when the technology works and maybe just as importantly, we know what to do when it doesn't. You know, what does that path for graceful degradation look like? And how do you make sure that the building still operates even if you don't have the connectivity you wish you did? Great, and really good, Barry, thanks for that. Sky. Yeah, I think I'll just touch on one point that Byron had mentioned. I think we have to think about, you know, what's the asset class? Who are all the stakeholders? Who is gonna benefit from each use case? And I think, again, like we can't solve every single problem, I think, from the onset. I think we look at what are the immediate use cases 
what can we implement now? What do we need in the future? And then you're just scaling up to have a really efficient system in play. And I think to that point, your connectivity decision will just come intuitively based on that solution. So it really comes down to that planning. Thank you, Sky. Uh, we're the, gonna go on to the next question, which is about security. And actually one of the questions that we have from the audience uh, is uh, about security. So I'm gonna, we'll touch on this question from our panelists and then um, we'll ask this question, your question on security in the Q&A. So um, I'll start with Barry here. Um, and here's the question for you, Barry. Security is an area that is brought up over and over again. And, and I can just say from the Laurel Alliance perspective, it's one of the biggest topics we've been dealing with this year. So I completely agree with that statement. So Barry, how can these devices and data be secured? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, security is definitely a, a multi-headed beast. And I think uh, just as I reflect a little bit on security, it could be the topic of many discussion panels on its own. So. Suffice to say that, you know, when we look at security here at mCloud, I, I would say that there's no one size fits all solution. I think it's important to understand what's important to a customer and the implications it has on the kinds of data that are going to and from a building. There's stuff that to consider like endpoint security, you know, where you look at the devices themselves, you know, what kind of data, what are you doing to keep data secure on device and how is that data securely transmitted from device to the edge to the cloud. Uh, you know, we've, we've touched a little bit on cloud and importance, the importance of data sovereignty, cloud security, you know, how and where is that data housed offsite and how is that data managed by potentially a third party provider. And of course, there's the, there's the practices of the vendors that you choose uh, to bring into a building project, you know, what kinds of practices are those vendors putting in place and what are they doing to ensure that data is limited to the right groups of people. There are lots of standards out there. Uh, both vendors and end customers have a role to play in understanding that whole landscape. And so, you know, I think security is a pretty complex question because there are so many different angles and so and a place where actually every stakeholder uh, really has a role to play in making it happen. Thanks, Barry. I mean, you're right. It's it's incredibly complex. It's its own subject all by itself. And even, even when you've answered it for a point in time doesn't mean that that answer is always going to be relevant going forward. Uh, Sky, would you like to add anything to that? I mean, I think generally the only thing, I think if we think about security, like very simply, it's really about what procedures are we putting in place to defend ourselves against exposing our data? And I think more importantly, our partners and customers data. And I think in terms of, you know, I think the other really great important part is once you have mapped out, you know, you're adhering to obviously best practices in the industry, but you're building out, you know, test me like test methods like penetration testing regularly, bringing in third party um, testing groups to really verify, and then all of your requirements that you're adopting as a business on top of what your customers require. I mean, we look at insurance groups and beyond. And, and again, very stringent, we take that on as a business, but we're also passing that through, you know, risk sharing as well as um, solving. And those requirements are going back down to the vendor and the partners to ensure they're also adhering to what we are as a business. So I think ultimately like, I think generally, yeah, security should be not just your, I think one of your number one priorities as a business and technology, but also something that you're constantly pushing down to your vendors and partners. Thank you, Sky. And Byron, let me think to add on this. Um, you know, like a lot of things, implementation matters a lot. Um, and the, the, the best example I could give is, you know, people are familiar with Wi-Fi. You think of the Wi-Fi network. Um, first of all, you have the choice of many different production or um, protection levels um, in terms of level of security. So, you know, if somebody doesn't pick the most secure one, then it's going to be more susceptible to hacking. Um, and then, of course, the type of password you choose and all those kind of things go into it. So the, the tools are provided. They're there but not everybody uses them in the proper way. And the same thing goes with, uh, you know, IoT in a, in a uh, you know, smart building kind of environment. If you think about it, there's kind of three big buckets. You have the, the device, which is collecting some data. You have a network, which is transporting it. And then you have a, um, somewhere where the data is being housed and, and acted upon. And you have to look at all three of those and make sure that they're secure. But just because you pick a secure protocol, 
um, if somebody hasn't implemented good device security, that network can be can be penetrated. Um, and if the data is not stored correctly, again, you know, the data can be uh, compromised. So um, you need to both pick um, the, the, the right infrastructure and the right platforms, but then you also need to take care and make sure that uh, what you have picked is actually implemented um, things in a, a correct manner. Thanks, Byron. And, and as Byron knows, uh, security has been something on top of mind for the Lore Alliance. And we actually have a blog about secure, uh, security matters, but so does implementation. So uh, we obviously 100% agree with uh, Byron's statement there. We're going to go on to the last question. I probably won't, because we've got several questions from the audience, I probably won't ask everybody to answer this question. But just to let the audience know that after we do this last question, we will go to the Q&A. There are a couple of really interesting questions in there. So here we go. This is talk about security being an opening big question that Barry said. Uh, and we're going to start this one with Sky. Uh, <laughs> this is a pretty broad one too, but interesting. Where do you see the biggest evolution facing connected technology, Sky? I think generally, I think we've all seen this today, smart cities, smart buildings. I think our current climate's really accelerating um, the drivers for IoT. I mean, look at us today, we're hosting this remotely versus in person on the ground. And I think ultimately, I think we're going to see a huge change, not just in the next five to 10 years, but over the next year, the next two years, I think it's immediate. And I think a lot of the drivers are really going to be through just making things efficient, safe, and I think ultimately finding ways to reduce maintenance, man hours on site, lower operational costs. And I think overall, I think a well brought up point by both Tess and Byron, I think around making things easier for tenants or just, you know, groups of people that are occupying spaces right now. And I think, yeah, happy to pass it back to you, Derek. Thank you. Uh, Tess, anything that you would like to add to, to this massive question? It is a massive question. I think Sky brought up a lot of really good points and I'm very much aligned in terms of you know, where we're going to allows for really the smart management of buildings, which means, you know, you can do that building management autonomously or remotely. You can have sensors that are looking at, you know, the monitoring and managing of the environments, the security, the safety elements. And that really, you know, plays into your ability to, you know, increase the efficiency, the automation also has impacts from an insurance perspective on risk mitigation. The other element that we're very excited about is, you know, the area of IoT in the area of uh, smart cities that's really about tenant engagement and management solutions, which really allows for the automating of communication and engagement between building management and the tenants. And we think that there's some really interesting solutions coming to the market on that at the moment. Thank you very much, Tess. Barry, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I think Sky and Tess already uh, covered some of that quite nicely. You know, I, th I think that there's a lot of room to play, especially as buildings take on more and more connected technology to take a look at how all of that information promotes better health and safety of occupants, uh, drives better cost efficiencies for maintainers, looks at ways in which we are going to be able to transform the role of the facility manager uh, or the building operator through that connected technology. I think we, we sometimes take a look at facility managers as having a very particular kind of job, you know, especially around cost efficiency. But I think it's, as Tess pointed out, you know, I think there's, a, there's an emerging role of the facility manager as uh, you know, an interaction point, a touch point with the tenant uh, and delivering a great occupant experience. And so I think I look at all of those as being really good opportunities when we move into a world where connected technology takes a lot of the tedium out of the day-to-day. -day. Thank you very, very much for that. And Byron, I actually have time for all of you to answer, which is great. Okay. Um, so I would say it's the opportunity for new business models to emerge. Um, if you, you know, you, you think of cellular and Wi-Fi, which people are all familiar with, uh, cellular, you know, kind of we're all comfortable with the business model of we pay per device, to, you know, to connect per month kind of thing. Um, Wi-Fi, that's not really been the model. The connectivity is free, quote unquote. Um, nothing's free, but it, it's, it's not, not charged on a per device connection basis kind of thing. Um, and I think IoT right now is, is kind of uh, neither fish nor fowl. It's, it's, it's tended towards the, the more of the cellular model. Um, 
but I think you're going to see emergence of uh, a lot of uh, very interesting business plans and um, that, that find ways to monetize the network uh, outside of just charging for access. Thank you, uh, Byron, very much for that. Um, and thank you, uh, panelists, for answering all our prepared questions. Really interesting. As I said, I took a lot of notes, learning lots of things, which is, which is great about um, the people in this space. I mean, there's so many different use cases, so many different challenges, bringing things to work together with an audience or a user that it just expects it to work. But there's a whole lot behind the scenes, and, and you all touched on a lot of things that need to be considered for that. And what I'm going to do now is uh, just slightly ahead of schedule, actually, because our panelists are so incredibly efficient. I am going to ask uh, some of the questions from the audience. And so I think this first question, Tess, I'm going to give this to you. Obviously, everyone can answer, but I'm just trying to figure out who should I give which question to. Uh, so this is a big question uh, in terms of the length. So here we go. There are a massive number of software, devi software devices uh, platforms out there. To be connected, they have to have a certain level of integration. How prepared are these new systems for integration that allows efficiencies? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think that Byron actually was talking about it in, in his last comments was really around the fact that there's different applications and different technologies that support different use cases. And, you know, we have, you know, we'll have some sensors that are going to use Wi-Fi. We're going to have some sensors that are going to use LoRa. You're going to have some sensors that are going to need 5G. So it all depends on the, uh, the use case that you've got, the need that you've got. You know, is it able to, does it, is it absolutely mission critical? And is uh, latency a big issue? Then you're going to want to be looking at potentially a 5G solution. So in case the, you know, heaven forbid your wired connectivity goes down, you've got that wireless connectivity to, to make it all work. Um, but I think when I think about the, the solutions on IoT, I think about the ecosystem that you're looking to implement because you're looking to get all of the different pieces that you need and find ways to make them work together. And so that's one of the things that we're spending a lot of time at, at in my organization is figuring out how we build you know, an ecosystem that's available to our partners where they can plug and play in all of the different elements, not necessarily only ones that are sitting on a wireless network but all of the different types of IoT use cases and make it so that it's a cohesive experience for the users and, uh, and the data is also working together so they can access the information that they need. Thank you, Tess. Uh, you know, ecosystem, it's incredible how much it matters and trying to go about it alone. Good luck with that. Um, Sky, anything you'd like to add to that? I mean, yeah, it's a um, good question, broad question. I mean, I, again, coming from the perspective of here at Eddy Solutions, we're hyper-focused on water. I think that being said, we also consider that in many cases, we will not be a standalone solution. We'll be married into other use cases. So as a business, you know, an example would be API integration, inbound, outbound. You know, do you want to focus on making sure that you're able to seamlessly integrate with your partner, take the lift off of all parties involved, and at the same time be able to stand alone or add in other use cases. So I, I think I want to say with the way the world is going and how fast we're now running, everyone has a front end facing system, everyone has their own solution. So I think it's just about being able to adapt. Um, there's definitely integrator solutions that can you know, bring all of the different solutions together. And I think as a provider, you're just building your business plan and your technology to be very agile for any scenario that arises, be it you're the integrator or you're bringing in other integrators to help marry, um, we'll say a cluster of solutions. Thank you, Sky. Barry, anything you'd like to add to this? I think Sky touched on it. You know, one thing that's really important, especially when we take a look at the vendor landscape, is that every vendor, you know, or many vendors anyway, tend to think of themselves as the platform. And there's no such thing as the platform. Uh, and one of the things that is worth considering here is, you know, when we're when we're looking at how to bring all of these different devices, software, platforms to the table, 
how are we making sure that we're thinking about this from the perspective of what a solution is for the customer? So I think that that orientation around solution is really important and one of the keys to looking at what integration actually is. I, I, I don't know that we're ever gonna to get to a place where there's gonna be an IoT platform that promises to connect to everything, integrate with everything seamlessly out of the box, You know, maybe one of these days, but definitely not today. Uh, and I, I, one really important way for us to get to a point where we can deliver something concrete to our customers by having that solution mindset in mind. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree with more. It's about the solution. It's not about a piece of it. The end user doesn't care that there's different technologies at the different pieces. They have a problem they want it to be solved. So I completely agree with that. Um, Byron, I'm going to give you this next question as the first person to speak with. I was going to give you a different one, but this one just came in. I thought this was pretty interesting and you can see everyone will may want to chime in on this. And just so everyone knows, we have about 10 minutes more uh, time left here. So Byron, here is the question and everybody as well, be ready. How are people finding economical ways of getting IoT connectivity in devices and tenants residences without using tenant Wi-Fi systems and avoiding high cost 5G, particularly where there isn't the advantage of multi-dwelling units like single family rentals or garden apartments? Yeah, it's big. You can definitely take that moment to. So, no, sorry, sorry. I was I was on mute. Sorry, <laughs> I was trying to be a good uh, a good panelist and had it on mute. Um, so uh, so I'm going to answer this for in the sense of IoT devices that are low uh, data rate requirements. Um, they specifically said without using tenant Wi-Fi systems, avoiding high cost 5G. Um, so, you know, you're kind of pushed more towards the, the stuff that's uh, a little bit lower uh, bandwidth requirements. Um, if you want to do higher bandwidth stuff, then you kind of need to either use a Wi-Fi system you put in yourself or a tenant Wi-Fi system or um, have, have a, you know, some kind of cellular connection um, to do that. So uh, there, there are ways to, uh, to, to avoid, um, you know, using those systems. Uh, the simplest way, if you're talking about a commercial application, um, you know, it, you can have a gateway, for example, a LoRa gateway. You have all the uh, LoRa-based devices that are scattered around the building or the residence uh, that communicate with this one gateway, and that gateway can then have a very simple uh, 4G or you know even uh, 2G cellular connection, 3G cellular connection, very low cost because you're talking about a small amount of data. Um, that is then you know, transported over the network. So that is, that is one of the typical ways that, um, that people are doing it. In a residential setting, there are uh, you know, a lot of the, the uh, both LoRa gateways and other kind of um, Zigbee, Z-Wave, you know, other, other kind of uh, technologies, um, just simply use the, the uh, tenant's broadband connection. Um, some of them can be Wi-Fi connected, some of them just plug in via ethernet. Um, but if you're, if you're seeking to avoid any interaction with the tenant whatsoever, really the, the best way to do that is uh, through a, a you know, older technology cell cellular connection that usually could be had for a, a very uh, you know, reasonable price. Thanks, Byron. Um, anyone else on our panel would like to add? I'm just going to open that to, to anyone who wants to comment on that. And if there are crickets, I will go on to the next question. Okay. Um, and I just like to say, you know, that was pretty tough because it was like a big question, but then narrow down the options for, for one to answer. And, and, you know, I just have to agree, you know, um, um, local connectivity that's efficient to get from the sensor to the, to a device and then finding some, uh, you know, typically cheaper cellular option or older legacy technology for the backhaul. Um, it's a difficult question, especially with where the world is going. So thank you for that question, for challenging us panelists. Um, I'm going to go with this next one um, to, I'm looking at my panelists, I'm going to go to Sky. I'll have you start and perhaps Barry could follow up. And we have about six minutes left, everyone. So. The person said, great insights, big exclamation mark. Regulation is a huge concern for connected devices. Do you, th do you think we have robust regulations in place? 
Good question. Um, I would say yes, but there's obviously room for a ton of improvement. And I think that being said, I think from a business level and industry level, we're all taking, you know, I think not just steps, but strides to continuously improve. And with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to you, Barry. <laughs> Thanks, Sky. You know, I, I think there's, um, I think there is regulation, as you say. Um, what I will say, you know, is, is it robust? Is it is it at all the regulation that we're ever going to see? I don't think so. I think we're still at very early days of how the space of IoT is going to be regulated. What what I will what I will put out there, and what I'll pose as a challenge to any vendor who who's thinking about IoT is to get out in front of regulation. Um, the people who are setting the rules don't understand the technology the way the vendors do. But one thing is for sure, if the vendors don't set the standards, government and regulators will. Uh, and the best way to get out in front of it is to be part of the group that's setting the standards by making sure that you're thinking about these things before they become something uh, legal in nature. So that's, that's one of the things that I would put out there uh, is that with respect to regulation, you know, there is a, an industry responsibility in addition to it becoming a regulatory compliance matter. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Barry. Got head nods all around because, you know, you, you really know some good points. Uh, Tess, is there anything you'd like to add? Otherwise, I will go on to the next question. I think go on to the next question, Derek. Okay, I shall do that. Barry, I'm going to start with you uh, on this one because uh, you were the lead off for our security question. So, uh, here's the question. Hello, I'd like to ask, how will IoT companies and solution providers work on winning customers' trust in terms of security and privacy? And that's a great question. And I, I think you mentioned it, you know, trust is something that has to be earned. Uh, and one of the best ways for IoT companies, I think, to build that trust is to have transparency. Uh, not just in, you know, the standards that are being employed, but to really be transparent in how those practices are rolled out uh, in their solution, how they work with the other people that are part of that ecosystem and part of that security solution or that aspect of the solution. All of those things are really important. Uh, you know, if the customer doesn't have visibility into how security is being implemented, uh, then they're then they're they're going to take the perspective of you know, you know the vendor's just saying trust me I've got it covered, uh, and while that might be true and maybe the the best way to handle certain circumstances for sure uh, the information should always be available uh, in a way that is accessible to whoever is asking. Thank you, Barry, and you know that goes with something Sky was saying earlier. You know, it's it's you're not doing it alone. You got to make sure you're bringing your vendor partners with you along the way. Uh, any other comments on this? This is probably, uh, we may have a time for another question, I'm not sure. Any other comments on, on this question? Trust and for privacy. Okay, I'm going to, this will be your last question, everyone. Um, and it's, we've all, it, it's been touched on in different ways throughout, but I think it's probably a good question to wrap up with. And um, let's see. Uh, Byron, I'm going to have you start with this question and then possibly have a uh, test follow up if there's enough time. So, are there necessarily any extra challenges to integrate two completely different technologies in the same network? For example, some devices using LoRa and some 5G. One is suited to low power, long range, other for high data range. Yeah, so um, I think you, you're absolutely going to have those kind of situations. There, like, as we talked about before, you got to, uh, you know, no one technology is going to be right for everything. So there's going to be certainly coexistence. Um, I won't even call them issues, but coexistence considerations. Um, you know, really, you're talking mostly about um, making sure that there's no problem with RF interference between the different technologies. And that's usually not really a big case. Um, there could be cases where you need to take that into consideration depending on what you're using. But you know, just like you have in your house, you have you know, Wi-Fi signals and Bluetooth signals and, and 4G signals and 5G signals flying all around. Um, you know, they, they all don't interfere with each other. And by and large, that's, that's not a huge consideration on the RF side. Once you collect the data, 
data is data and you know you can you can integrate it into a management system of some sort or an analytics engine that uh, that allows you to take actions on the data that's collected that that part's fairly easy there's lots of standard interfaces um, you know to to uh, cloud-based uh, compute that that will allow that thanks Byron and and Tess I'm going to kick it over to you and and you will close out our responses from the panels for this webinar Oh, Anything well, you'd like to add? Thank you for the final position, Derek. Um, <laughs> I, I think that as, as Byron said, you know, you're absolutely going to need to use different technologies to hit all of the use cases that you're going to have in your implementations. There's just really no way around it. And I mean, even if you just look at, you know, 5G connectivity in the wireless network, we're looking at LTEM, we're looking at narrowband IoT, we're looking at you know, full 5G, they're, we're moving into a world where we're going to be able to splice the 5G network and dedicate certain sections of it out to customers, either for different types of use cases or to specific customers. So we're moving into a place where it's going to become even more important to make sure that you're attaching your use cases to the right connectivity method. And, you know, there's, there's, there's LoRa, there's Wi-Fi, there's Bluetooth. So you're just going to have to go through and figure out what is it that you, that's really important to you for those applications? Are you really looking for, you know, long-term not being, not needing to change the battery? Are you, are you needing high bandwidth or low bandwidth? Are you needing constant, you know, um, tech, you need constant responsive and low latency? Or are you okay with just, you know, at 3 a.m. having a little upload of a little, of a little stream of data to, to feed, uh, you know, the data engine that you have in the back? So once you understand what you need, the technology that you will need to leverage to support it is going to become pretty apparent pretty quickly. Thank you very much, Tess. I'm not in my head. I've been doing a lot today because uh, our panelists have been great. Lots of good information and feedback. Thank you, everyone uh, of our panelists for participating today and providing your expertise and your experience. That will conclude our uh, panel for today. And I want to thank all of you in the audience who joined us as well. Hopefully we provided, well, I'm sure we provide some really good insights because our panelists have been great. And I'd also like to let you all know that the next session, which starts at 3 p.m. Eastern, is titled The Future of PropTech, a C-suite level discussion. Feature speakers from PCL, BGIS or BGIS, Karma, TCA, and Eddy Solutions. So with that, I will say again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the audience and we will be signing off. Have yourselves a lovely day and make sure to join the next session that starts at three o'clock. Thank you everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.